Hello, welcome back to Oz Business Australia's only live streaming business and markets channel. Great to have your company on this Wednesday, the hump of the week. We kick off the afternoon on Ausbiz as usual with, uh, with the call where we look at 10 stocks that uh, you suggest and we put them to an expert panel for their adjudication. And um, um, it's for the next hour or so, uh, 60 minutes, that's all we do. So and we do it Monday to Fridays. And uh, today we're going to do something a little different because uh, remember a couple of weeks ago, we had a focus on ETFs. We had an ETF special for the hour on the call. Well, today we thought we'd take a look at IPOs because you've asked us to uh, review so many IPOs over the last week, three, four weeks. They're hot at the moment. So we thought we'd just focus on your questions on IPOs and see, put it to our expert panel to see which ones uh, are going to do okay, which ones may need a bit of time to actually settle in. And uh, so it will be a fascinating hour ahead. And to bring us through all of that, Conrad Song from Macro is with us. Conrad, how are you? Very how, good. How's business going? Very good, very good. We've just moved offices, so yeah, oh, been busy. excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Did you get a better rent? Oh, 100%. <laughs> it's amazing at the moment, it's the deals that you can do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, IPO's hot at the moment? Uh, the very markets? much so, very much so. Yeah, we've yeah. seen, um, I think, what, 15 or uh, 15 uh, last month. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's starting to pick up, which it, it, caught, it caught off, you know, obviously with COVID, yeah. but it's yeah. starting to pick up again. So. Yeah, it's interesting. Chris McDonald joins us from Morgan's. Chris, oh, yeah. how are you, sir? Good to see you, Koshi. Um, this wave of IPOs, mm. is it good for the market? Or is, you talk to some people and they go, oh, that's the ringing of the bell <laughs> at the top of the market. Yeah, it's interesting. I heard there's up to 150 IPO and potential IPO targets over the next six months. So there's wow. definitely a rush. <laughs> wow. uh, but it's not surprising, I guess. We've got uh, record low interest rates. Uh, people are being presented with uh, 0.5 for their term deposits. So I guess people oh, have no. to make their money work. Yep. And uh, um, businesses that want to turbocharge their growth are looking to the markets to access capital. So yep. uh, I think we've got the combination of two. Demand, people want to make their money work more, harder. And, and the supply coming from these new businesses that want to take the opportunities presented, yeah. not only in Australia, but globally to expand their businesses. Are there any themes behind it that you're seeing? Not really. I think of, across all the industries, or? we're seeing all of them come to the market at once. But, but remember, this is a build up. So during COVID, there were a lot of businesses that ah, wanted right. to come to market. Yeah. They all shrank into their shells. There were a lot of listed companies that placed a lot of stock, as you know, from Flight Center and Webjet all the way through. Yeah. So uh, we saw a soaking up of that uh, capital, if you like, initially. And a lot of those uh, IPOs that would have happened at the start of the year are now racing to happen right. uh, over the next uh, three to six months. Yeah. So busy times. Uh, Conrad, when an IPO comes in front of you, mm -hmm. of course, they've got the deck there, the investor deck, and it always looks positive. And, always has an addressable market that is in the millions or the billions or whatever. What, do you, what are the key things you look for mm. in an IPO? Um, great question. So I think firstly, it's, you, you, you have to try to understand the business. I, I think one of the difficult challenges is that corporate advisors or, or wealth management firms that sort of support uh, these transactions is that sometimes they, they don't understand the business as well. Um, and so what we try to do is we, we try to understand the business then we look at sort of really um, sort of strict criteria, I think, and, and every business is different. Um, and again, that's yeah. why you understand it first. Yeah. Um, we like to look at the macroeconomic themes um, that have to do with the industry specifically. Uh, obviously, right now, COVID's a, a, a big impact. Um, and, um, you know, we can see that from you know, consumer spending behaviors, for example. So um, that's one thing. And, and the other thing is it's an exit strategy. You know, how are our clients going to actually make a return? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's about understanding, you know, obviously first what your clients want, um, but then, you know, really sort of assessing the company uh, in its own right, understanding it and saying, okay, well, it looks like they have a runway to actually yeah. list this thing yeah. um, or, or, you know, have a, a strong performance after the fact. So. Okay. Chris, what do you look for? Well, we were just off air yesterday discussing a, an IPO with, um, with one of our guests here on Ausbiz and he was talking about one and said, I put money into it because it's a great theme in a good sector the management's really good, mm. and they're locked in yep. for two to three years. Sure, um, and and that locking in the founders mm. and the management was a, a key thing for him to look at an IPO. 
And there's four great reasons. Yeah. I mean, what you need to do is filter. So at the end of the day, you've got a limited amount of capital, or most people do anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So generally, you either have to take risk by buying an IPO and using cash, which is obviously safe, even though it's not really earning anything, yeah. or you need to sell something. So in theory, it's got to be better than what you're selling. So there needs to be a bit of a truth test. As you said, shiny new prospectus or presentation, <laughs> they all look amazing. Yep. They're all fantastic. I wish them all well. It doesn't mean they're right for you as an investor. So I think that's a good health check. Right, yeah. What is my true risk profile? Because usually when they IPO, they're relatively early stage. They're high growth, high promise, blue sky. That comes with risk, yep. right? They're not generally established businesses. So yep. I think we need to not get too caught up with the millions you can make in two, two minutes. Yep. Back management, first, second and third, how much skin they get in the game. And we can talk about some of them and maybe highlight one or two that have recently yep. come to market that, yep. that really um, play that out. There's a book I read fairly recently called 100 Baggers. So this is businesses that go up 100 times. Now, the biggest way of earning 100 times your money on an investment is to hold it for a long time. So right. the average was 20 years to hold it. That's a wow. long time for a lot of investors. But they're looking at the return of the equity. So how much return is this? How much, what percentage of money is this uh, company making year on year? And yep. then what are they doing with that money? Are they reinvesting in the business? Are they buying shares back? Are they buying other businesses? But really one of the biggest indicators is <coughs> successful management that have done it before. They backed it with their own money. They're locked up for a minimum of two years. Yep. Uh, in a growing sector. So mm. if you're really okay. guided by that, the big question though, and, and it's a good health check, is an IPO come to market, there's usually some peers out there. So they should, I think, when they list, be trading at a 10% discount to where they probably should be. There should right. always be a little bit of fat left yeah. to help it get away in the post-IPO market. Yeah, that's interesting, because if you, if you look at Adore Beauty, which yeah. is one of the big ones recently, mm -hmm. um, had a good sort of first day. Yeah then dropped yep. uh, below the issue price. And I, I checked it uh, just in preparation for the show today. It's almost back up to the list of mm -hmm. um, the issue price uh, and a bit higher at the moment. So mm. it's, it's waiting for it to settle down and market get comfortable with it. It is, and I think that was pri fully priced. Right. Let's be okay. polite. And a, lot of, and a lot of institutional activity is generally mm. at that sort of early stage as well. So ah. that volatility sometimes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So mm. they'll take their profits early and Depends. then maybe yeah. get back in. Correct. Right. And we'll see that theme again today when we go through these stocks. Uh, sometimes you need to let stocks settle, yeah. particularly after a great debut. People yeah. get a little bit excited and yeah. traders get involved and it takes a while for that to wash yep. through the market. Okay. All right, let's start getting into the stocks. I always, before we uh, chat about your 10 uh, recent or upcoming IPOs, um, I do a stock of the day, something that's in the headlines. I thought we'd go to the other extreme, but linked to IPOs because they have to list on something and they list on the ASX. Um, and the Australian Stock Exchange's dramas continue following a shutdown of operations on Monday. ASIC now revealing it's considering further action, citing concern over the exchange's infrastructure. The company says it will continue to engage constructively with ASIC, the corporate regulator, and is very confident that it's meeting the market licence obligations. Um, apart from being embarrassing for, yep. <laughs> for the ASX, Conrad, um, what do you think of the ASX as a stock? Um, well, so even before, let's say, this debacle, um, if you take a look at sort of the, the activity, so we've seen a significant increase in volume, um, yep. trading volume, and obviously with COVID, retail money jumping in, trying to take advantage of this thing. Um, now, that was kind of offset with lower IPO uh, listings, uh, which obviously impacts um, the ASX stock price. But um, that's kind of reversing, and we're, so we're seeing sort of a cooling off of the trading volume um, and, and that sort of IPO listing activity yep. sort of pick up. Um, so uh, overall, like there's sort of this net net, f um, you know, sort of experience with the ASX. But this um, sort of outage, I mean, obviously it, it, it stresses um, the unreliability um, of these improvements that they're making. Um, I think the takeaway really is, okay, there should be an increase in expenses to sort of improve or, or manage these risks moving yeah. forward. Um, now. ASIC are looking into, so the actual specifics of what they're looking into is the center point sort of feature. Now, usually it's, it's, just, it's like matching. So institutions generally use a lot where they kind of match in between with their own clients who you know, want to buy and sell. Um, so that's being looked at. Investors are obviously quite frustrated. Um, some of the features in the sector 
sort of um, uh, section of the website and the announcements are just not as good apparently. Uh -huh. um, but it looks like obviously the competitors are, are going to start looking in now. Chiex, um, I think I saw a post from them on LinkedIn, um, uh, you know, saying that you know we could take the volume, you know, come to us kind of thing. So right. it's interesting. Um, look, but it's the ASX. Um, it's it's here to stay. It's the biggest stock exchange on Australia. Um, and um, look you're going to have sort of teething issues as you improve. Yeah. What they're doing is they're taking um, the ASX trade platform and using NASDAQ data to sort of improve that. So, yeah. Yeah. so I had a great run in the share price. Yeah. Um, pulled back a, a little bit um, in the last couple of weeks. Would you be a buyer of the ASX? Um, not at this stage, oh. yeah, no. Chris? I'd probably be a seller short term. If I'm right. short term again, if you're a long term holder, I, I agree they'll probably iron things out. But yeah. uh, if you look at that chart, the market's rallied quite strongly over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks. Uh, that's been declining for the last four months, which is yeah. never a good sign that it's going the opposite direction to the market. And it is the market, so to speak, in terms of the trading yeah. platform. Uh, there will be some threats from Chiax. Expect them to sidle up to a lot of the big broking houses saying, well, why don't you open up a secondary uh, opportunity to trade in case this happens again. It's a pretty yeah. good argument yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was very, very frustrating to spend all day not being able to trade for clients. That mm -hmm. uh, And if that happens again, you're now getting into sovereign risk and some pretty big issues, right? Yeah. This is actually, to be able to buy and sell stocks is quite an important part of mm. the Australian economy yeah, yeah, yeah. and global economy because there's a lot of global money as well. So it is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and now there's a cloud over this business unless it's until it's resolved. They'll probably need to spend more money in technology. They've got a big technology spend with chess in 2023. So I tend to wait. As we've talked about, there's a lot of IPOs. That's a lot of income yeah. for them over the next six months. I think you can get that cheaper, maybe even at $75 and get that tailwind. Once they're through mm -hmm. the smack okay. on the backside for their behavior, yeah. uh, there's probably a buy there, but certainly, uh, we don't need any more uncertainty when we're buying stocks at the moment. There's enough okay. external uncertainty. They've just uh, kicked an own goal and I'd stay away. And probably if I held a lot, I'd be trimming at this point. Okay, all right. Okay, let's get uh, into the stocks that you've suggested we take a look at. And uh, Chris, first up, Luke wants a view on mydeal.com.au. Um, came, uh, issue price at a dollar. Uh, raised about $260 million, an online retail marketplace operating, sort of, it's been compared a bit to Australia's version of Amazon, I suppose, isn't it? A little um, bit, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Morgan's was involved in, in my deal, so I'll keep my uh, right. comments personal and general. Uh, but certainly it is an online marketplace. Uh, For furniture and homeware. Mainly in homeware. Like so yeah. uh, Temple and Webster have been a very successful online yeah. business. They sell their own product. Uh, my deals sell other people's product and they're starting to sell their own product. Yeah, they've got and one called, really called Duke. Correct. They, which is the, yeah, um, and they, their and, house brand. And they promote that quite strongly and certainly that's going to be much higher margin for them. Yep. So the positives about this business for me is I see uh, still over Christmas, a lot of people will be at home. They won't be travelling overseas or interstate. So people when they're home more, they tend to look at rearranging the furniture, shall we yeah. say. So I still think this Christmas will be a really strong period. They can grow through their own brand and they can grow through other acquisitions. So, you know, is it a dollar stock or a $2.20 stock? It's probably somewhere in between. It came out of the gates very strong when online was yeah. going ballistic with Kogan, Temple and Webster and others. Yeah. Probably been oversold down here below 120. Uh, so I'm actually happy to buy this business because it does have a lot of growth drivers. Um, the other interesting thing is about 40% of people purchase more than once. Right. That's quite high. Yeah, yeah. And even the advertising and the float will probably put more eyeballs into this uh, website. It's actually not bad. It's good value. So I think they're going to have positive momentum into this quarter. So I think those numbers out in January, February will be very good. And we should see it in the high dollar range, not in the low dollar range. So there's probably a buy there for people. Okay. Um, and, the, and the sector's <coughs> still growing. I mean, it's not like electronics, homewares and furniture online is still an emerging business. Mm. So we don't have saturation yet. So and, there's still some positives. Yeah, and Conrad, they're saying that um, online sales penetration in Australia at the moment, 5% in the UK and US, 15 and 16%. So they're seeing a lot of growth. Temple and Webster, as Chris was saying, been a mega star mm. <laughs> during COVID. Uh, what do you think of my deal? Um, well, I, I think 
that's actually the problem. So I'm going to actually sort of disagree with this one. Um, so firstly, they, they are doing some good things. So they've launched, uh, or they're launching an app. They've got the private label, actually takes about 2% of their current um, yeah. sort of revenues. Um, they've made some sort of good technological developments. You know, a lot of that sort of core demographic they target is the millennials, and they're starting to shift into that as well. Um, the problem is for us is that you take a look at sort of recent demand in retail, and that's picked up aggressively, yep. um, obviously due to COVID. Now, obviously online, especially with no one out able to go to a store, um, is, is quite, quite strong as well. Um, for us, and pretty much across most institutions, uh, it's, it's, fairly, um, it's fairly unanimous that this is going to normalize. Consumer spending behavior is going to normalize. Um, and if you take a look at the actual well, figures- Well, go back to the shops. Well, so it's, it's not going to, this is not going to maintain, it's not going to be, it's not a permanent shift. And I'll tell you why. Oh. So firstly, um, if you take a look at what, what the institutions are saying, I mean, we're seeing downgrades with West Farmers, JB Hi-Fi, Temple and Webster, good name. Since mm. October, um, or end of October, they're down 27%, mm. right? So people are pricing this in. Yeah. Um, now, if you actually take a look at my deal as, a, as an ind individual company, um, it's, it's great that, like I said, that they're, they're doing some you know, interesting things. Um, year on year, up until fiscal year 19, they had, I think, about 100% growth um, every year. That's phenomenal. And that's for uh, gross, mm. uh, gross transactional value. Um, so that's where they clip the ticket, right? Yep. So um, really strong, really strong. But in fiscal year 19, they had a 7% decline. Now, one might assume, okay, you see a, decel uh, a deceleration, um, but a decline, that suggests a, a decline in demand. Right, and, and so obviously, so it was 7% and then 156% increase um, due to COVID, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the, the question begs, okay, well, what's, you know, what's the, the future prospects of this? Now, we actually managed to get in touch with management yesterday just to prepare for this uh, interview. Um, now, it's a short, in, uh, it's a sh short conversation. Um, yeah. Also, you know, over a phone call, things are misinterpreted. So yeah. uh, we could be wrong, but it, our takeaway was that they felt as though the um, the shift was here to stay, which is, which is right. you know, a, a fair valid debate point. But um, if you actually sort of take a look at, um, like I said, what's happening with Temple and Webster, the, the, the pricing in, uh, we feel as though if, if management is not taking into consideration that this could be a risk when everyone starts shifting, if travel opens up, mm. money's going to go to travel. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, if if stores open up, well, people will go to stores. Now yeah. they do. They have taken up a lot of them. You know, grown their market share through this experience. So that's strong. Um, but as far as getting into the space now, I, I think I think it's 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 a it's a COVID uh, sort of thematic that we're we're a little late to. Okay. From, from here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, but appreciate you uh, suggesting that to us, Luke. Let's go. Uh, uh, Conrad, into our second stock. David wants a view on Credit Clear. Um, this was a, a, a fintech business, um, similar, if you like, to, um, uh, to Credit Corp, if you like, in that loan book um, management space. Uh, issue price of 35 cents, raised um, 15 million um, in an initial market value of $79 million. Uh, we talked a little earlier about people backing it. This one, uh, Gerd Schenkel, who was a former National Australia Bank executive and with Tyro Payments, another listed uh, finance company. Brenton Glaster uh, was the founder of Credit Solutions, which is a debt recovery agency that Credit Clear actually bought. Um, so what do you think of Credit Clear? So, yeah, so um, they've done very well. 128%, uh, I believe, is what it's up from its issue price. Um, now, so what they actually do is so they're an online platform for debt collection. Now, instead yeah. of traditional business models where you sort of buy debt ledgers, yeah. um, they don't own any debt ledgers. So it's, just a, it's a pure communications platform. So instead of having that default risk, they charge purely on the emails and the texts that right. go out to their clients' respective late payments. And that's users. the difference with Credit Corp, which buys ledgers, doesn't it? Co yeah, well, well Credit Corp, I, I haven't done too much analysis into, yeah. uh, not too sure, probably. Um, what, what, I would uh, what I would say is that um, the actual environment that they're in um, is, um, so, so we just spoke about how, you know, we might be a little late to the party for a, a retail play because of COVID. Stocks already rallied or, or the growth uh, has already happened. Um, this is an interesting one where we feel as though the effects are going to trickle down. So yep. uh, you take a look at sort of the current COVID environment, right? So household uh, uh, lending is up 26% from last year. Uh, we have um, high unemployment. We have low wages growth. Uh, you add to that, ASIC came out with a, a recent study uh, on buy now, pay later, um, sort of, you know, the industry. Um, 
really, really interesting. So 20% of users on, of buy now, pay later platforms uh, either missed or were late to an essential bill to pay for a buy now, pay later repayment. Yeah. So that's the equivalent, of, you know, same as, you know, you, you miss a rental bill, you don't pay your rent, you pay for your second installment of Nike shoes that you picked yeah. up. Um, Christmas coming around the corner, it's only going to exacerbate that problem. So that's good for credit, you know, uh, collection agencies like right. um, Credit, but they don't have the default risk. And so that's why, um, that's why we, we would back the stock. Management, as you said, is, is, is quite strong. Uh, Gerd, uh, CEO of Tyro Payments, um, so that's, that's you know, quite strong. But um, yeah, no, we, we, we like right. the space, yeah. Chris? Yeah, look, very briefly, it was well back with smart money, for want yeah. of a better word, very strong management. You're looking at a theme transitioning online. Uh, it's global scalable platform, which we like. We do have some tailwinds in terms of increase of credit uh, chasing, shall we speak, yeah. over the next year. Um, and the traders got involved with this. It was a very hot IPO, went to the moon. It settled back halfway from that, still up from its IPO. Yeah. I think you can start accumulating from here. Remember, you're buying blue sky. Yeah. You look at the revenue now, it doesn't justify the share price. So you've got to back those trends to continue. Uh, but I think they will. So you can start accumulating here. As I said, it got a bit out of control. Everyone was buying it because it was going up. Yeah. Then they were selling it because it was going down. Yeah. I think the, the price will probably settle around this 70, 75, and it's worth accumulating if yeah. you've got the risk tolerance and probably worth holding for three years. And, and the issue with this sector is as well, uh, Credit Corp's big in it. Uh, a lot of the others have got into trouble, yes. haven't they? And it's such an old-fashioned industry, buying these ledgers mm. and debt collection. Um, a bit of disruption was being seen as probably good uh, for it going forward Absolutely. as a sector. So yep. well placed for it. All right, uh, Lisa wants a view, Chris, on uh, Duke Exploration, the copper, silver and gold explorer. Uh, recently, uh, recently raised money and they're... Uh, this is more, uh, it's not a straight sort of mineral play, is it? They, they use new technology to find new exploration. They areas. do. There's always something new to find yeah, the yeah. bits that people what missed over the years. Kenex is Kenex. a spatial predictive modeling 3D ge uh, geological mapping and minerals targeting firm. Wow. Um, I'm excited. Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, so we were also involved in this IPO and it's done quite well. I think it's about 40 cents and listed at 25. Uh, let's step back. We're talking about a sector. So we're talking about copper. Demand for copper is only going one way, which is up. Yep. We're not finding enough copper. So the demand supply, and you look at the sh uh, copper price at about 325 a pound is six year high. So you're in the right place yep. in commodities. Yeah. Uh, it's in demand for copper piping, anything to do with big infrastructure, which is happening globally. And of course, the most expensive metal that goes into a car is copper. Yep. So uh, particularly with electric vehicles. So we've got a good structural dynamic to play in copper. Why do we like this? It's in Queensland. So there's not really any sovereign risk, or you can argue about that with Palaszczuk. <laughs> but, um, and also there's existing copper and a resource there. So they're looking yeah. where they already know mm. that there is copper. Where yeah. do you look for copper where there's copper? Yeah. So from a risk reward, I think we're going to get pretty solid results. Will it eventually become an economic mine? Well, that's the risk, we don't know. Sure. But on a risk reward, you're on the relatively low risk because they're not trying to drill a blind target. They kind of know where the copper should be yep. and, uh, and you expect results. So yes, it's risen up. It's about 30 million market cap, so it's not as cheap as IPO. But you can argue there's enough drivers and news flow that it probably has a bit more upside to, okay. to move. With these sort of stocks though for Lisa, I would generally, and I do it myself, put a portfolio, try and pick two or three or four uh, copper explorers because it's still early stage. They're spending money, not yep. making money. So there is risk yep. and kind of diversify. But I don't mind it. Solid management again. And uh, and they're drilling right now. So I expect results in the next few weeks. OK, Conrad? Uh, yeah, pretty much agreeing with most, <clears throat> you know, all those points. Um, just to add a couple of uh, points to it. So um, gold, silver, copper, uh, five projects, 200 application. The flagship project is the Bundara project up in Queensland. Um, so the interesting thing about this place uh, is that in the 1800s, it was the highest grade copper project in Australia. Um, mm. So obviously that's hun literally hundreds of years ago. So yep. things have gotten better. People <clears throat> know how to look for things better. Um, so as we see development in sort of drilling and, and, and sort of uh, exploring techniques, um, the results have been good. And we've seen that they've come out with, I think three results to uh, were, were quite good um, and and um, 
again, the space, at the right, right place, right time as well. So copper's obviously infrastructure spend, I think as well is a good point as we come out of this recession, yep. that's gonna push copper prices up. Gold and silver, you know, they're at high levels now. Um, that's expected to stay uh, at, at with low interest rates and, and sort of inflation risk environment. So um, yeah, we like it. One, was, one thing which was really interesting, we, we dug up that the geotechnical engineer at Oz Minerals, uh, so his name is Kieran James Slee, he acquired six million shares um, of, um, of, of DEX, making him the largest shareholder um, at 8.06, 8.02%. And so that's the equivalent <clears throat> of, let's say, you buying, yeah. I don't know, uh, nine, nine, no, no, channel nine shares. Right. So it, it's a good <laughs> oh sign, God. it's a good signal. Buy it first, buy Osby's shares. Well, exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. You have exactly. to go to a break, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, The problem is that, because you founded it, right? But yeah, this, yeah. this is, a, it's an external third party, you know, validation. You know, validation. I, yeah. think that's, I think that's the key here. So that, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. That's an interesting thing to look at too, mm. as well. Follow um, the money. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Smart money too, this guy's yeah. clearly smart. <laughs> All right, well, uh, following the, the money, um, Byron wants a view, Conrad, on High Pages, and it just so happened that we interviewed uh, the High Pages Chief Executive, Roby Sharon um, uh, Zipster, last week. Um, let's have a look at what they had to say. Obviously, the core business has a lot of growth in it, and uh, obviously, we want to invest in that technology further. We've got technology that we acquired recently and are looking to uh, grow on that. That's around field service software, uh, where we provide quoting, scheduling, integration with accounting platforms, um, all of those things that help small businesses, like trade businesses, to help manage and run their businesses. So, we want to make our product stickier. Um, for them and obviously provide further services for them down the track. So there's an incredible amount of investment in that technology that needs to happen to make that work. Um, we've already started some of that investment, but there's more to go. Um, in terms of the product itself, in terms of marketing um, and getting more brand awareness out there, we will be making more investments there. Um, and then there's just an, a huge amount of ancillary services that we can provide into the platform in the future and we'll be looking to make investments in those areas as well. Okay. Um, raised $100 million, $2.45 a share. Basically, they're an online platform that matches tradies with residential and business customers. And uh, News Corp uh, is the largest shareholder with uh, just over 25% um, interest in the, in the stock. Conrad, what do you think of uh, High Pages? So they've already got, what, 36,000 tradies subscribing to the platform at the moment. Um, so that, that's, a, that's actually a, a key point that I want to raise. Um, they're not going to like me. Uh, News Corp's not going to like me. Um, we don't like this stock for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, so what they do, as you said, they connect tradies with consumers. Yep. Um, Airtasker. Airtasker have a, a slightly different business model in the sense mm -hmm. that they're transactional. They cut, yes. the, they cut the ticket. These guys generate leads for tradies. So the only paying customers are, are the tradies. Um, 36,000. 36, Airtasker, 910,000 users and 140,000 uh, taskers. Right. Now, you might say, okay, well, Conrad, that's because Airtask has been around for longer. Yeah. Well, they haven't. They've been around for eight years, um, less than High Pages. So High Pages ah. has had you know, a, a significant amount of time to take up this market share, and they failed to do so. Um, the other interesting thing is, is so they've, they've done some good things. They've got the block. Um, you know, the, it's a nice partnership. Yeah. Um, however, again, to shift the focus to Airtasker, um, now they've I, so um, high pages IPO great. Um, Airtasker actually has done a non uh, deal uh, roadshow with Macquarie. Yeah. Now um, for people you know who know what that means, that they're probably looking at you know trying to drum up a little bit of interest for their own IPO potentially, right? right? Yeah. Um, so my advice or, or, or my sort of view on this is that if you like the space, go for the guys that have done it better, yeah. um, and go for the guys who probably have. Um, um, you know, uh, the, the, the business model that's going to sort of weather through, I think what High Pages is really struggling with is just acquiring clients. I, I think right. that's really their problem. But um, yeah, look, hopefully the block um, is, does wonders for them. I, I think they did lose IKEA as a partner, which is no good as well. So yeah, um, yeah that's, okay. that's our view. Yeah. All right, wait for your task up. Uh, Chris, what do yeah, you Yeah, it's saying? a little bit tricky. This is an example of, on, on first reflection with News Corp, Fairly high yep. quality offering in the online space. 
people think it might be the next car sales platform or the next seek yep. platform or the next realestate.com platform, sure. right? It's yep. a big market. They've now got a war chest of $100 million to spend to hopefully, hopefully acquire more of those tradies. Um, I think, again, a victim of so much interest, they probably priced it a bit high. Right. So we've seen that. It's kind of been around the issue price, got away a little bit and it's settled down. I, again, they're saying to the market that they're going to be uh, losing money in the short term. They're growing at about 15 to 20%. I think in this space, you need to be a bit higher, 30 to 50% growth, really to capture uh, that blue sky and justify the share price. So for me, it's probably, if, if you had it, Maybe you can hold out, but it's certainly not a buy here. I think it's right. fully priced and there's uh, some uncertainties with a big gorilla potentially uh, yep. getting ready to rumble. So yep. uh, I don't think you necessarily have to be there. It's kind of caught between a startup with explosive growth and those three established players that I just talked yep. about in that platform and, space. And it's been around a while. Yeah, so. well, yeah. And, and I think just, just to add, so COVID is a major impact to this as well, right? Yep. Again, consumer yep. spending is going to change. People are going to spend less money and less time on home improvements. Uh, any stimulus that's come out to sort of support that sort of industry, um, it's large contracts, it's large corporations, not these do-it-yourself tradies and, and things like yeah. that. Uh, so uh, we just can't see the, the future prospects for this okay. one. Yeah. All right. Um, Chris James wants uh, a view on Caspin Resources, another uh, resource company. Um, exploration projects in the Yarra, Winderbrook and Mount Squires uh, region. Mm. Did a sort of deal with Oz Minerals, didn't they, to, to form this? They have, and a bit of a spin out of Cassini as well, which yeah. the management's come across. So look, reasonably solid management. This is a little bit of a neurology story. Doesn't mean you can't make heaps of money by drilling near a discovery. <laughs> Don't need to find something. Don't worry about that, just drill near it. Look, nickel is one of those beautiful things. You say nickel sulfide, people get excited, going back to Poseidon, going back to uh, serious resources. Uh, and Azure more recently has done a great run on finding nickel sulfide. Yeah. So for me, I guess this is in that pure punt category, put your play money in, they price it cheaply. Uh, even if they get a sniff of nickel, this thing will run, but it is in the high risk, high reward. Um, they're gonna poke around. They're not, you know, there aren't walk up, go targets with decent historical intersections of nickel sulfide. So right. it is in that pure risk, you know, cross your fingers play. Honestly, as I said, the market's pretty good for nickel sulfide. But if you wanted to play that, go further up the risk curve. Azure Minerals, backed by Mark Treacy. He is right. a bit of a nickel god over there. They have discovered nickel and it's recently gone uh, uh, 30 cents to 90 uh, today. Okay. Um, uh, over the last few weeks, but on finding nickel sulfide. Right. So for me, maybe go up the risk curve. I'll put a little bit in this for your fun. But if you want to play on that, uh, we're in the middle of a discovery and yeah. it might become a mine probably still got some upside with less okay. risk. Conrad? Uh, yeah, 100%. So it's very early stage, very, yeah. very early stage. Uh, so when Oz Minerals bought Cassini, they basically said, okay, well, we'll keep that, we'll keep that, and we don't want that. Um, that's uh, Casper. Now, um, gold, silver, nickel, and platinum group metals. Um, so, you know, right space, uh, again, similar to sort of DEX. Problem is, they don't know what they're sitting on, um, where we're do you know, do. Um, the management team is strong, uh, like we touched on, but yeah, overall, I, so, so there's a term that's pretty interesting in the um, demerger agreement with Oz Minerals, and that's um, if one of their mines, it's a West Musgrave mine, yep. Um, yep, West Musgrave project, if that's sold, um, or if any of the nickel in that project is sold, um, Casman is set to make up to 20 million. So this is, you know, you don't want to bank on that though, right? So that's like going to, you know, the roulette table, not even going black or red, it's going on zero, right? right. And so yeah. it's, it's risky in a risky environment and, you know, that specific thing, although it's interesting, it's even more risky, so. Right. Yeah. Okay, all right, avoid that one. All right, you're watching a uh, IPO special here of The Call this afternoon. Let's recap uh, the first five stocks, including our stock of the day, um, which was the Australian Stock Exchange, because it's been in the news lately and all the IPOs have got a list there. Um, a no from uh, Conrad, uh, Chris, has, Chris Conrad was saying, look, if you've got, take some profits on ASX shares and sell out, if it gets down below 75, then get interested again. Uh, my deal, a yes from Chris, a no from Conrad. Uh, both Conrad and Chris like Credit Clear. Uh, they also both like uh, Duke Exploration. Uh, high pages, no. 
and Caspian are no a bit too high risk. But if you want to be in that that nickel area, Chris is saying Azure is probably a better existing stock to look at. Uh, here at the call, we have uh, our own portfolio that we've been tracking since the 1st of July. Any stock that gets two ticks, two thumbs up from our expert panel as Duke Exploration and uh, Credit Clear have today, go into the call's portfolio. So let's see how it's performing for the week. It's up about two and a quarter percent for the month, 3.6% since the 1st of July, uh, 21.4%. And take a look at some of the stocks that have been added recently. Credit Corp was added to the calls portfolio recently. Ioneer, uh, Ike GPS, Ridley, uh, Clinavell. Some of the stocks take it out um, because if they're in the portfolio and then they come up again on the call and our two experts don't endorse them with a unanimous vote, they then go out. Uh, CSL has uh, been taken out in the last week or so. Take some profits on that, it's had a good run. Uh, also BHP. Now, if you want to uh, take a look at what's in the calls portfolio, go to osbiz.co forward slash portfolio. And uh, coming up uh, in the next hour after the call, Plenty is out with its uh, first half results after listing on the stock exchange earlier this year. Uh, Daniel Foggo is on the show and we'll be talking about the results and where to for the company in the future. So that's in about an hour's time here on Ausbiz. All right, let's get back into um, the IPOs, recent IPOs you've asked us to have a look at today. Homeco Daily, um, raising $300 million at $1.33 a unit. Basically, it's uh, a REIT, a real estate investment trust, uh, going to own 17 properties, um, mainly retail um, shopping malls. Um, and generally anchored by Woolworths or uh, a Coles as uh, the two largest tenants. Um, Chris, what do you reckon of, um, of Homeco? Yeah, so we've been in the spicy end of the market with some of those <laughs> previous ones. I guess Homeco is an interesting one. Again, we were involved in the IPO due to this shortly, so a bit of a caveat there. Uh, some of their properties uh, were spun out of Homeco, which was the old, a lot of the old master sites that were yeah. taken over and put into big box retailing and yeah. other opportunities. This is one that's worth looking at, I believe, if you are looking for an alternative to cash, right? Mm. So this is, this is a yield with a little bit of growth. Okay. And I'll explain that. So they, we talked about pricing. I think this was priced appropriately, probably 10% below its peers, as it should be. It's got to prove itself in the market and it should close yeah. that gap. They've come out and said that they, they are hoping for a total shareholder return in a year of about 10, 10.5%. So 5.5% straight yield and maybe about 5% in share price growth. Right. right. So for people that want to you know, hit it rich, it's not for you. But if you're looking at uh, the underlying asset, the key risk is that Woolies, Coles, Chemist Warehouse can't pay their rent. Yep. Right. So we call that fairly low risk. The other thing is... It's 98% occupied. That is extraordinarily high. So yep. it, they're full. Uh, a lot of the sites aren't fully developed. So they could put a medical center there in the future. They could add some more, as and when required, space to their site. So yep. they're not fully capitalized, which we like. And uh, they're, they're anchored really for eight and a half years is the average lease time. And uh, I think it's about 3% okay. rental increase every year. Right. So these are, these are when people mainly just do their daily needs shopping. Right. 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 There's a little bit of big box retailing, so you might have an Anaconda and a, right. Conda and a few others. But so, it's, so it's between your big shopping malls and your strip shopping centres. Correct. So um, They're in metro growth yeah, yeah. corridors. And obviously with COVID, people are more happy just yep. to shop locally and okay. get their groceries, get their you know, their meat and their bread, right. etc. So for me, I like it. It's, it's, it's an easy thing to understand. It's relatively low risk as far as REITs come. It's in the right space. It's not in office or residential yeah. uh, property. It's pretty well anchored. And if you look at its pricing compared to Aventus or shopping centres, Australasia, which was spun out of Woolies, or even Bunnings Warehouse Trust, it's priced pretty well. So I okay. think it'll travel okay. Don't expect it to go up 30% on day one, but if you're struggling to go, what do I do earning 0% cash? This might be worth chatting to your advisor about. Okay, Conrad? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I agree that it's a very defensive name. Um, and as a result, I think um, really, if you're looking at IPOs, you're probably not looking at this. Um, there, there are alternatives out there. Also, the upside is really limited. 
Um, it's really limited because, uh, so foot traffic are, so for stores, retail stores is pretty much at almost pre-COVID levels. Yep. Um, whereas office space is commercial, industrial is not. Yep. Um, so if you're looking for upside, uh, which th this is really not the, 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 the you know, asset to do it with, um, it's got 5.5% you know, fully front yield. Um, but um, yeah, you know, we, if we were to go into REITs, uh, we'd prefer not retail, um, right. we prefer industrial. Um, so look, it's a yes, but it's, you know, there's other stuff there too. Um, it's going to be the biggest IPO last, so the parent company is spinning it off to so the daily needs component. Sure. Um, and so that's all the, the retail stuff we spoke about. And that's, and that was the biggest IPO of last year. So it should have some good support institutionally. You can see Goldman Sachs, Macquarie, uh, Morgans, Audmanet, uh, Jardin, uh, are jointly brokers. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's what it is. Yeah. All right. For a good defensive stock with a good yield. Correct. Yeah. All right. Clint wants a view, uh, Conrad, on Magellan Global Fund. Yeah. Um, so Magellan, so basically what, so what they're actually doing is they're restructuring three global equity funds into a single trust, right? Yep. Um, investors should probably be aware of the fact that there's something called open and closed um, classes. Um, I won't go into details, kind of boring, but what the takeaway is closed, uh, it's fixed number of units of shares. Um, so as a result, the sort of price generally trades at a bit of discount to NAV. Um, the performance, however, Magellan, they're, they're managed by a, a, a really strong team. Uh, and that's that's coming from a wealth ma management firm, right? Yeah. So um, the last six months have been a little laggy. They had um, a fairly conservative approach globally, like most institutional funds. So Reuters came out, or they come out with a poll every sort of month. Uh, last month they said that we're at five-year lows institutionally globally for equity allocations. Yep. Um, so they had, I think, so they had what's 19% uh, from March to May uh, in cash, and they've only started to really unwind that uh, to 12% uh, in October. Um, now, if you, if you compare sort of where they sit as far as performance goes, um, they've outperformed Pendle um, by 6% on a one and three year basis. Um, they've outperformed Platinum um, by, one, uh, by uh, 16, 13%, sorry, uh, on, a, on a one and three year basis. The only thing I would say you want to look out for is there might be some short term volatility. They have about 50% exposed to the US and Europe. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, the Bank of America came out and they said, look, equities, are, they, it's coming back in. People are deploying the capital back in institutionally. Um, but they've still got the COVID problem, um, yeah. you know, much worse than what we have it here. Um, I think, um, you know, naturally that's going to take some time before, before we see a recovery. So, yeah. You like it though? Yeah, but we like it. Yeah, okay. we like it. Chris? Yeah. Again, you've got to back Magellan as a group. They yeah. have a history of picking winners. Uh, it's got an interesting mix of your yeah, Alibaba and Alphabet, but then they've also got some big um, plays like Novartis and Record Ben Keyser, Starbucks, etc. So they are global. Uh, yes, they have some tech. For a lot of investors out there, we talked about before, holding over time. Now, this is, these guys over the last 13 years have returned four and a half times your money. Wow. So 450% return if you're willing to hold. Yep. And this is it. This is for long-term investors that want to diversify their portfolios so they're not just in 3% of the global market being Australia. Yep. This gives them access to trust someone else to pick over time and you're paying them 1.3% to do it. Uh, and I think for long-term investors, it's definitely l worth looking at. Right. I'd be happy now looking ahead if I got 450 percent return over the next yep. 13 years when I'm ready for retirement. I'd take that now. Yep. And that's what you're looking. Don't expect it to outperform in three months, six months or even a year. It's not yep. for you. It's for sitting back and going, I'm sitting on all this cash. I've got five years to 10 years to retirement. I want access to big global businesses that have yep. the balance sheets to grow and acquire other businesses. And that's really what the decision and, and Magellan as a business that it's getting the fees is also worth looking at. The, mm. the mothership, so yep. to speak, that are getting Absolutely. the fees. So All definitely right. happy to back Magellan management okay. and long-term investment. All right, Sam wants a view on Chaucer Energy. Um, this is a gas producer, but produces the gas out of coal fields using technology uh, pioneered in the Soviet Union back in the 30s. I've, this is an amazing story going Absolutely. through this. Now, in Australia, you, you can only do it in, in Queensland um, um, because there's bans in Australia from getting gas out of coal fields. Um, but then in Chile and South American um, countries, in southern Chile, um, 
they've really got a big market apparently. Um, uh, issue price at, at 20 cents, raising about five and a half million. Mm. Uh, Chris? All right, so we just talked about we're really giving someone some money to drill and hopefully we find something and everyone gets rich, right? Yeah, yeah. Which can be fun, but it's a different risk profile. This is different in the sense that uh, we're going into Chile, you know, since Pinochet, it's been reasonably okay, although there's been some little bit of tension. So a bit more sovereign risk. Len Walker, who is behind a listed company in Australia called Lead Creek yeah. uh, in, in South Australia, has proven this technology works in Australia with coal beds. Again, he's been frustrated by the current laws. So he's gone, well, where is there a need to use this technology yeah. that's been around for 90 years? And he's shown it works in Australia. So he's now going, well, Chile imports 100% of their energy. They have a need. They're happy to play. They're going to approve. And they may have a plant in 2023. So we've got a different risk reward profile here. You know, because there's risk, you can buy it fairly cheaply. Yeah. You're probably going to have to back the management here that have shown that they can do it with technology that's been around for a while. And you're going to have to be patient. I mean, this is a risk you've got to go through. They've got to drill. They've got to prove it. They've got to do environmental, a lot of environmental yeah. that it doesn't leak into the water table and things like that. So risk is high, but the reward, if you can have an alternative locally produced power, which, mm. is, which is a greenhouse gas, but not as bad as coal, yep. and you've got demand from a government, the rewards are very high. Yeah. So yes, it's a big risk reward play. I'll probably again be prepared to wait, but I like, look, I like the theme. I like the problem it's solving. So okay. there's definitely interest there, but we're still in that high risk, be prepared to lose yep. it all because okay. you know it hasn't been tried in Chile before. Yep, high risk, comrade. Um, so I, we spoke about what I look for um, in a company, what we do. Uh, we understand the story. We you know, dive deep into the actual details. Um, and as a result, our opinion is extremely widely different. So I'll, I'll start from the beginning. Um, Phoenix Energy uh, in 2016 is what they started as, reborn as uh, Chaucer in 2019. Um, now they, so, so the, the actual tech, ISG, so in st uh, situ gasification. So they take sort of really deep coal that's usually unavailable for open cut methods. Yep. Um, and they take that and they pressurize it um, and, and use oxidants. Um, to heat it up and, and that turns into what's called syngas. Syngas then turns into electricity. Now, so what they're trying to do is go to Chile and use this, this technology and sell the electricity. They tried this twice before. Um, third time lucky, I don't think so. So first time in Queensland. Now, they might have had some success, but in terms of um, the, so, so the government basically said, it was, so there were three companies doing this. And they said, okay, we're going to ban you and shut you down because we've noticed unusually high benzene um, traces in neighboring bores. So, right. so they get kicked out. So then they went to Indonesia. Indonesia said, okay, the permits um, are they're not commercial. So they got declined there. So now they've gone to Chile. Now I understand why they've gone to Chile, the, the whole coal play, I get it. Um, however, one of the things that management has overlooked here is that there is a broader rhetoric in Chile to actually move away from coal as an energy source. Right. Now they've got an agreement in place uh, with the Chilean government and uh, you know, electricity generation companies that's looking to phase out coal uh, as an energy source uh, you know, in, in, by, by uh, in, in 20 years. Right. Um, so this is very much um, a, a process where they have to apply for a lot of these regulatory you know, applications and, and through these bodies. Um, that's been a major struggle for them in Chile. Th so the Chilean government has actually come out and said they don't have any experience in ISG pr projects. Right. So that's uncertain. Now that, that doesn't mean okay. they're not going to take it on or whatever, but right. um, that's a, that's so a bit too high risk. Yeah, okay. it's too much. All right. Now, we'll have to whip through these final two because yep. uh, we're sort of fast approaching the top of the hour. Um, Jack Wads of you on East 33, um, an oyster producer, mm. um, $32 million um, IPO uh, coming up uh, next month. And the company specialises in um, farming and selling Sydney rock oysters. What do you think? Sydney rock oysters. The benefit um, or the, the differentiation between that and uh, Pacific oysters is a key sort of focus here. Uh, Sydney rock uh, oysters are, have a longer shelf life. That means right. they can be exported easier. Ah. So, yeah, so this company, what they've done is they've partnered up with a uh, Chinese business, uh, mm -hmm. Shangjing Island Fishing Port, run a couple of tests uh, with shipments and, and logistics all sort of getting check, uh, tech, uh, checked off. So that's looking good. Um, the interesting thing is, so there's 120 billion oysters that were farmed uh, in 2018, and that's globally. There's only 72 million Sydney rock oysters. 
right? Oh. And that's because they're exclusive to Australia. Yeah. Um, the only other competitor that's sort of on the ASICS market uh, in the oyster game really is Angel Seafood. Um, they're in, uh, they're, they're in um, uh, Pacific Oysters. Right. So they, 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 you know, they're competition, but it's not directly um, sort of, you know, um, they're luxury items. Um, so naturally with the whole COVID environment, um, people are going to spend less on luxury goods like oysters. Right. Um, so that might be a little bit of a tailwind, but yeah. But we, we, we like this, so we think it's actually quite exciting. Um, mm. And so, yeah, okay. yes, Russ. And a uh, good relationship in China, yep. Chris? Absolutely, and, and we look at the oyster market, the price has been going up for the yep. last five years. I've actually been on the, the beds in uh, Coffin Bay with Angel Seafoods and have right. them out of the water. They're pretty nice. They had a good update today and they're looking at really ramping up production. They sell every single Coffin Bay oyster in Australia. So even though they can export it to Hong Kong or China, they don't need to because they're making yeah. enough money domestically. So that's yeah. a positive. I think you can play both. I think Angel's looking to scale now so they can export, but all the demands in Australia. Sydney Rock's different market, longer shelf life. This is a roll up story. So they're buying more leases and assets and companies yeah. and, and more cheaply and getting a multiple uplift. It makes money, we like that. Uh, and if they can get the export uh, right, mm. the demand for quality Australian aquaculture produce is very strong globally and not stopping. So I think you hedge your bets. You could, if you like oysters, I think it's yep. good to like what you own, it's particularly in food. Um, buy a little bit of both, Angel okay. and uh, East 33. All right, and our final stock. Uh, Clue is an online tut tutoring company from kindergarten to year 12, 52,700 tutoring sessions in the first quarter. Uh, company expecting to post revenues, bid over $15 million. Up from five, that's tripling in a year. So this is a hyper growth business and they need to be because they're pricing it at $143 million. Right. So 143 and 4.9 is a very steep multiple on revenue, right? Yeah. 30 times revenue. If it's 10 times revenue next year on a hyper growth story, yeah. So this was a business I know for a fact Everyone wanted this stock, right? Because it's on trend, really yeah. smart. It's moving on to platform. It's virtual um, online, which has been weaponized by COVID. People couldn't do face to face. Yeah. So we separate that. Yes, it's got a COVID effect, uh, but the move to online tutoring and education is quite strong globally. And the market's gonna grow by 16% year on year okay. in this education tech. So you've got a growing global market, smart money backed it. It's gonna be hot out of the gates you won't be able to pay what the IPO price is. It's going to come on a premium. My guess is like some of the others we've talked about, wait until the traders settle down and it becomes a sensible price two yep. or three weeks after list, yep. then have a look at it then. But I okay. think it's a great space, smart money and seem to be just mm. kicking goals. Okay, Conrad? Um, yeah, we love it. Um, I, I agree with sort of getting in at the right price, you know, let the, let the vol volatility play out for you. Um, so the interesting thing is, you know, we, we touched on weaponizing, you know, this, this company with COVID. Um, unlike sort of retail and, and these other trends that we're seeing sort of shift to online, this is something that we see a permanent shift in. And I'll tell right. you why. So um, when you have online uh, retail stores, there is actually a benefit in going to a real store. You touch yeah. it, you, you put it on, you can you know, see if it's real. Um, when it comes to online tutoring, so it's only tutoring, might I yeah. So uh, um, the, the, the benefit is that, um, well, firstly, 84% of students prefer it, obviously, yeah. right? 72% of tutors think it's better, um, but 73% of parents prefer it. Yep. Now, parents are the one who pay. Parents want to have to pick their kids up, take them back. No, no, uh, parents, <laughs> I'm seeing it with the grandkids at the moment. Everything from dance classes to maths tutoring. Exactly, and so with that, 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 that shift is definitely, I, th I yeah. think, there. Look, the management is why we really like it, though. Right. Um, so they've got a, a history of working together um, in education companies before this Think Education Group oh, uh, yeah. and also Open Colleges, right? Okay. Now, so the, the founders, you know, management team, they've pretty much got loyalty, right? Which is, which is something very rare in a lot of industries. Yeah. So um, they've also had a good track record for actually exiting. So Open Colleges sold uh, to Apollo Education Group in the US 2000 13 for 160 million dollars. Right. right, so these guys know right. how to do it. So, so they know, know how to build a business and get out of it and take the money out, which is perfect. All right, let's, uh, let's recap uh, our final five stocks. Um, Homeco Daily, the REIT, uh, a yes from both uh, Conrad and Chris, if you're after a stable income theme uh, through there. Magellan Global, a yes from both. Uh, Chaucer Energy, very high risk if you want to ha have a look at it. Um, East 33, a yes from both of them. And Cluey, 
uh, a yes but wait wait for the share price to settle down because it will be a hot stock to start with but good company good founders um, who know how to build a business and uh, and also make it investment worthy. Uh, Conrad Song from uh, Macro, good to see you, mate. Thank you for coming Thank in. Much. Chris McDonald from Morgan's always to great you. to have you. I hope you enjoyed this uh, special edition of Osbys, um, where we just looked at IPOs. Back to a normal the call tomorrow. Uh, if you want any stocks for us to look at and put towards our panel, uh, email them in the call at osbys.com.au or through Twitter using the Osbys TV handle. Don't forget the call's portfolio. Head to osbys.co forward slash portfolio to have a look at that. Close of business uh, newsletter in your inbox, 5.30 every afternoon. Uh, the wrap up of the day of the markets and business from Nadine and Scuddy. You can get onto that mailing list through osbiz.co slash join. And on the Startup Daily Show between two and through, two and three o'clock, Mark Lewis, the founder of uh, Crew Mojo, a new platform that says employee development should be front of mind all year round and help your business doing it. That's coming up between two and three. Hell of a lot happening on Ausbiz for the rest of the afternoon. You don't want to miss a minute of it. We'll take a short back break. Be back after this. We'll be right back.